So are there any artists in the room? Any artists? No? Well, that's a shame. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned last night that I wanted to talk about something in particular today. Do any of you remember what it was? Very good. Yes, the drawbacks of sensual pleasures. So that's fun. <laughs> Is that fun? <laughs> drawbacks of sensual pleasures and the benefits of renunciation. The benefits of renunciation. So is anyone here attending the Monkey Mind retreat that I have coming up with the Mahasatipatthana Buddha Society of Klang? A few, okay. So this is like a bit of a dry run, okay? So, <laughs> so I'm just testing something out. You are my guinea pigs, as they say, right? So I want to share two animal stories with you. The first is about a poor little monkey. This monkey is in the forest and in that zone of the forest where humans have come into contact with the animals of the forest. You know, there's some places in the forest where it's just animals and then there's this zone in between the human zone over here and the animal zone. So in the middle there is the monkey-human zone. So the humans like to trap monkeys and they use what's called a tar trap. A tar trap. You know what tar is? Tar's like the stuff they use to make roads and when they boil it up, it's hot and it's really sticky. And if you, if you touch it, it's stuck on you. I remember going for Pindapata. So I always go for Pindapata barefoot. And in this part of Sydney, they'd just redone the road. And it was a really hot day. And because it was just like they just repaired a small little bit, they didn't put any signs up around it. Anyway, so I trod over this little area and I ended up with like gravel and tar stuck on my feet. <laughs> it's pretty sticky stuff. So the hunters, the way they trap a monkey is they use tar. Maybe they put something sweet in it or... And so the monkey comes along and it reaches out with its hand. Oh, stuck. And then it reaches out with its other hand. Stuck. Oh, no. And so it thinks, okay, I'll push away with my feet. So it gets one foot and kind of pushes away. What happens? Stuck. And the other foot? And then it thinks, right, okay, if I just use my snout to push away. And so that monkey is stuck, right? And the hunter can come along and take the monkey and do whatever they want with it. So this is an image of sense desire, right? There's something in that trap the monkey wants, right? That's why the monkey goes there and it gets stuck. This is, this is uh, an image we find in the suttas. So the five points of contact, two hands, two feet, and the snout, this is the five senses, right? So this is the way we usually encounter the world. This is the way we enjoy the world.
but there's some drawbacks to that enjoyment of the world. What do you do for fun? What do you do for fun? Eating? Yeah? Eating's fun. Yeah. Walking? Yeah? Cycling is fun. Yeah. What else is fun? Movies, music, um, uh, dancing. Yeah, dancing is fun, right? Okay, and all of these things are enjoyable, right? They're enjoyable. Are they 100% enjoyable? No, why not? That's right. Like people who have shellfish allergies but still love the taste of prawns. And they put themselves in... De- I know people like this. They have an allergy. They could die and yet they want... Or um, say you eat something really, really spicy, too much chilli and then you end up feeling the effects for a few days, right? Or what else is... yeah. Huh? What's that? Pufferfish. Oh, that's danger, right? You could die. That's the thrill. Okay, so so there's some some drawbacks. And you know, when I think about something like food, there's so many so many disadvantages. You know, you have to look for food. You have to find some food. Food can be quite disappointing, actually. You go to a restaurant, you read the description, you think, oh, yes, this is going to be good. Comes out and it's this deconstructed Caesar salad or something. There's like half a lettuce over there, there's a crouton over there. And and you think, this is quite disappointing. Or it doesn't taste good. It doesn't live up to your expectation. Or sometimes... You have a favourite dish and you go back to the restaurant and it doesn't taste as good as you thought it did last time. So it's like this for all of our sensual pleasures. All of our sensual pleasures are, are like this. There's enjoyment, right? Otherwise there wouldn't be sensual pleasures. And there's also drawbacks. So the Buddha talked in these terms. He said there's enjoyment, drawbacks, and an escape. So there's these three aspects to things. So with sensual pleasures, it's really easy to see the enjoyment, right? And it's hard to see the drawbacks. Unless we see those drawbacks, we won't even contemplate an escape. And so the Buddha said, there's five... Oh, no. That's okay, I won't go there. I'm going to talk about something else. Still, the Buddha said that there is many types of pleasure to be had in the world. For many of us, We think the five senses pleasures, the pleasures we experience with the five senses, we think this is the highest pleasure that can exist, right? So sometimes we even try to multiply our pleasures. It's like, okay, let's go see a film. Not just at any cinema, but at like the IMAX, like the biggest screen possible. And 
let's just not get an ordinary seat, let's get like one of those lying down seats. And let's not just do that, but we'll get popcorn and what else? Coca-Cola and the ice cream, choc top. And if we can just put all of these pleasures together, we'll have the most pleasurable time, right? But then, like, maybe the movie's bad. I remember going to an IMAX, like a cinema like that, and there were people falling down the steps because it was so steep. Uh, maybe the popcorn is stale. Like, there's, you can just never get 100% pleasure, right, from these things. Anyway, so the Buddha says, look, I don't deny that these things are pleasurable, but there is a pleasure that is higher and more serene. And so for him, this is the pleasure that comes from meditation. And in this sutta, which is the Bahufadanya sutta, the, the, the many types of pleasure, many types of feeling, the many types of feeling sutta, we find the Buddha talking about the various kinds of pleasures that exist. And that first one, that, that sensual pleasure, is at the very bottom of the list. <laughs> and the Buddha talks about the pleasures that come with first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, and keeps on going up and up and up and up until he says, you know, the, the pleasure of nibbana, that is the highest bliss. And, you know, there's a lot of pleasures in between nibbana and that pleasure of sensual pleasures all the way down there that many of us have never experienced, right? We've never experienced the joy that comes with meditation, let alone the extreme bliss of deep meditation. And so when the Buddha talks about pleasure, he talks about pleasure wherever you find it. For him, the mental pleasures, the pleasures of meditation, the spiritual pleasures, were far more superior to the pleasures that we can uh, experience with our senses. So for that reason, he encourages us to look at the drawbacks of sensual pleasures. If we can understand these drawbacks, then we'll be less inclined to indulge them. Think about the things that prevent you from meditating, coming away on retreat. You've got so many wonderful things to do in the world, right? Maybe you've got to work so that you can enjoy those pleasures, so that you can pay for the Netflix, pay for the internet, pay for your music streaming service, pay for your nice new car, pay for your nice phone. You could be doing anything else at the moment. You could be out having a nice um, breakfast at a cafe. You could be going sightseeing. You could be on holiday. There's so many things that compete with your attention for meditation, right? And sometimes you come, think, oh, I'll go do some meditation. So you almost get to the cushion. And then you think, oh, I'll just have a cup of coffee first. <laughs> and then that coffee becomes, maybe we'll have a little bit of cake. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, well, you know, I feel a bit full now. I can't really meditate. So I'll just go and lie down and enjoy some sleep. <laughs> and that's it, gone. So this is, this is why these sensual pleasures prevent us from being able to enjoy the bliss of meditation. And that's before we even sit down, right? And then when we finally sit down, because of the habit pattern of our mind, which is always looking for satisfaction in the sensory realm, we sit down and a few moments in you're thinking, maybe I should have that coffee. Why didn't I have that coffee before I sat down? Why don't I just go and have it now? And up you get, and you're gone. Or you think, maybe I'll have some cake. Or you think, 
I wonder what's happening in my phone. I see you. I see you watching your phones during meditation time. So, <laughs> yes, nervous laughter. <laughs> what were you looking for? Something else. Anything. <laughs> but having to sit there with your mind, right? And so sensual pleasures take us away from our meditation in that they agitate the mind, they distract us, they won't give us any peace or stillness. And the reason for this is that our habit pattern of the mind, always looking for these sensual pleasures, is so strong and we only see the positives, right? Whenever you think about that fancy dinner out, you're always thinking about how much you could enjoy the food. You don't think, oh, it's going to be terrible and the people at the next table are going to be loud and annoying. You only see the positives. You never see the drawbacks. And so the Buddha asks us to, to balance out our experience of these things by seeing, okay, there is this enjoyment and there are some drawbacks. And then he asks us to practice renunciation. Renunciation, nekama, is voluntarily giving up sensual pleasures. Voluntarily. No one is forcing you. No one is making you do this. You voluntarily give up these pleasures because you have some wisdom about them. You understand. These are short-term limited, they're unstable, they change, they decay. So with this wisdom, you stop being infatuated by them. And when you're not infatuated by them, they have no control over you anymore. You stop associating them only with pleasure and you start to see, oh, there are drawbacks here. And that power of renunciation allows you to practice the spiritual path more fully. You have more time for your meditation. By doing the things that I've been saying to you at the beginning of our practice, let go of the world outside, give yourself permission to be here, I'm encouraging this muscle of renunciation you want to be here. You don't want to be doing all of those other things you could be doing. Making that decision to practice renunciation is what allows you to feel comfortable to be here. Deciding, I want to be here. For a moment, I'm giving up that stuff outside. It allows you to have some freedom from sensual pleasures, to focus on your practice. So renunciation is a very powerful thing. And it, it allows us to, to experience the kinds of spiritual pleasures that aren't associated with senses. Does that make sense? So another animal that we, we uh, might think of, instead of that monkey getting its poor little hands and feet and snout trapped in the tar, Another animal is the turtle, a little turtle. There's a story the Buddha tells about a clever little turtle who is getting attacked by a jackal. And so what does the turtle do? Just tucks everything inside. Yeah, Tucks its head, its four feet, and its tail inside. Safe, yeah? Safe in its shell, protected. So these are the six, six senses, including the mind, right? You've got the five senses and the mind tucked inside that shell. This is a good image of renunciation, right? Sense restraint, especially. We're not getting involved with the senses because if we did, that if we put our 
hand out, the jackal would take it and we'd be gone. So instead we kind of tuck ourselves inside. If we allow for our senses just to range freely all over the place, there's a lot of danger for us. And so this is a good image, right, of a turtle tucking itself away. And that's what you're doing here when you come and practice or when you go on a meditation retreat. You're like that little turtle. So our first activity is what is your meditation animal? What is your meditation animal? Who was it the other day who had the panda? Panda cushion. Yeah, do you remember what you said about the panda cushion? He wants to be like a panda. Yep. Yep. Yes. Good, right? Beautiful. So that's a nice meditation animal. What's your meditation animal? It could be something that you're already doing, like, you know, you could be like that monkey or you could be like a spider, always like making little webs in your mind. Um, could be a little pig, kind of like always going over something, ready to eat something, you know, always hungry. Or it could be something you aspire to, like, oh, I wish that I could be more relaxed, like a like a sloth, okay, <laughs> fine, yeah. Or wise like an owl. Or today I was thinking about this and I was thinking, what kind of animal? And I have a few in my head, but today the one that came to me was the hippopotamus. You know, hippopotamus is just kind of like and they're just like just hanging around enjoying themselves in the water. So what's your meditation animal? Huh? You're a bird. Free. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Anyone else have one? Yes. Lion. Yes. Rawr. And actually in Buddhism, you know, the lion's roar is what we call when an arahant becomes enlightened, we say they give a roar, a lion's roar, and it's usually they give a short verse saying, I've done my work, I'm enlightened, there's no more rebirth for me. And that's called the lion's roar. Yeah, great. What about you, Venerable? Hawk. hawk. Why hawk? Uh, yep. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Okay. Very nice. I thought you'd be a bit of a poet. <laughs> so, does anyone not have an animal? Oh no, okay, Ooh, what are we going to do? Do we need to help suggest some more animals maybe? Let's see, ants, always busy helping, helping to build uh, something. What else could there be? Uh. Huh? A rabbit? Yes, going down a hole. <laughs> yeah. So my suggestion is don't think too hard about it. It'll come to you. But what we're going to do is we're going to draw our meditation animal. <laughs> so you've got, you've got this thick texture. And so I was going to suggest that we, we take two pieces of paper 
And the second paper is to protect the floor. Okay, or you could fold you could fold it in half or whatever. We just don't want we want to make sure we don't hurt the floor. I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Chores and responsibilities, well, they're not things you do for fun. Ah, uh, yes, responsibilities. If you have responsibilities, you should do them. Yeah. So when, when we do meditation, we can get really beautiful states of mind. And then we have to go and do the dishes. And that's okay. You know, we have to do our responsibilities. We can't just um, we can't just let them go. We need to feed the cat. We need to feed the kids. We need to brush our teeth. We have to do all these things. Yeah. Even though it's never ending. <laughs> no, it's okay that you're late. You don't need to apologize. Yeah, you had things to do. It's fine. And this stuff takes us away from, from our practice. But we, the, part, the, the whole thing about this weekend is that we're looking at ways to develop joy in our life that we can bring into our meditation. So if you've been doing things like looking after your family and um, maybe we can transform the way we look at those chores into acts of generosity. And when we do these acts of generosity... We can feel good. It can help cut away at some of the underlying resentment we have at having to do these things. And I, I know how it feels. Like I have to look after some senior monks sometimes, you know. You have to wash their clothes and do this and do that. And if you've got a mind which is full of resentment, then you'll really hate every moment. But if you have a mind of love and generosity, then it becomes an enjoyable task. But sometimes the way we, we think about it can change. And then sometimes we can also just take a break from these things so that we can come back to them more fresh. But let's talk a bit later about that. Let's concentrate on our animal. And so what I'd like you to do is write, my meditation animal is, and write the name of the animal because I'm not sure about the skill of the artists in the room. <laughs> yes, yes, you can get some images if you want. And then draw the animal, and then underneath it, write a few words about why. So you can use this texter. If you're using this texter, make sure you either fold your paper or use a second piece of paper to protect the floor, because I, I want to be invited back.
So how are you going? I reckon we'll just like 30 seconds left. It's probably better to spend less time and more time on this. So don't forget to tell us why. Hey. I have to say I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> Take a little bit, just like take one, one tiny little piece and pass it on. So have you written down like why you chose it? Yeah, good, okay. Okay, so we're gonna stand up once you've got the piece of blue pack. Just take a little bit. And pass it along. Just a tiny, just a tiny little bit. We don't need much. And. Yeah. Um, So we've got a few minutes, is any of you? We can do some stuff up there. Can you come up with an animal? You can do it at home. You can do it at home. Okay, so, very good. So just take a few moments to kind of stretch out. So the meditation animal, okay? So something to work towards or work away from. Maybe it's just good to visualize a part of our practice, right? So, everyone.
one more group? We're going to sit for, a bit. We're going to sit for another 10 or 15 minutes. And then we'll do some meditation. Okay. So. Okay, so thank you for, for being very deity. So I might do something similar for my next retreat. Sometimes I like to try new things. So this was a new thing. And thank you for going with me on that journey of creation. So another animal about sensual pleasures is a dog going to the butcher shop and that butcher has scraped clean the bones so that there's no meat left on that bone. And he tosses it to the dog. And that dog takes the bone, gets the taste of meat, but doesn't get any meat. It gets the flavour, but no nourishment. And so the Buddha said, this is like us, with our attraction to sensual pleasures. We always think, if I had that thing, then I'll be happy. But the happiness is shallow. It is just like the flavour. It never really satisfies us, does it? I mean, just, just think about you on your phones. You think, just, I could just scroll a little bit more, then I'll find some happiness, won't I? Yeah? So you keep scrolling. <laughs> you keep scrolling. And then you realise that you're just, it's just your thumb moving. You know, there's no true happiness to be obtained there. And then you think, later on you think, why don't I just check again? Maybe this time. And so you scroll, you scroll, you scroll. You're still not made happy, right? You, you only reap weariness and disappointment, the Buddha says. And this is how it is for so many sensual pleasures for us. We have this anticipation, right? Oh, this is going to make me happy. A new phone. So exciting. We get it. It's exciting for like two minutes. And then it's boring. A new car. We're so proud and happy to have this new car. And then... A few weeks later, we've forgotten that it was a new car at all. Or our treasures, like our nice jewellery or um, family heirlooms, could be stolen, gone, forever. Or you could knock over that family vase and break it, smash it into a thousand figure, uh, smithereens. Or fire could destroy it. Or floods could take away your home. These places where we put our enjoyment are full of drawbacks, full of dangers. They won't satisfy us. So in this, um, this sutta where that, that dog is, this is the Pataliya Sutta, Majjhamanakaya 54. The Buddha gives a series of images about the drawbacks of sensual pleasures because he's trying to encourage the listener to practice meditation and renunciation. So the first image is the image of the dog. 
The second is the image of two hawks or birds of prey fighting over a scrap of meat. Have you seen this happen? Sometimes I've seen on YouTube some people showed me this like this this um, little bird who has found like a rat or something and is kind of flying away with it. And then a uh, like larger bird comes and swoops and takes the takes the catch. And so they fight over this stuff. This is a bit like us, isn't it? You know, I mentioned the other day, I mentioned those like Boxing Day or Christmas Day sales that you see on television. I'm not sure if they have them here. But, you know, it's like a big sale and they kind of, there's people lining up out the door, they open the doors and people come in and they're fighting over underwear or fridges, you know. And people have died. People have died in these sales. Like, isn't that crazy? But we also compete all the time in jobs, um, the real estate market, auctioning. We're always competing for these sensual pleasures. So this is another drawback. We have to fight for, for this stuff, right? Another drawback, he says, is it's like a grass torch, you know, like a, 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 a torch that's made of grass and you light it, it's on fire. And there's wind coming and you get ashen embers in your face, right? You get burnt. And this is true for so many of our sensual pleasures. We get burnt by our sensual pleasures. Sometimes they can become an addiction or even something like um, alcohol. You drink, you get drunk. The next morning, you feel horrible. You feel terrible. You've been burnt by that pleasure. Even, you know, if you were to have too much chocolate cake, you would feel sick, right? Sometimes we eat so much, we actually feel really unwell, right? So there's this danger. You know, we get burnt by our sensual pleasures. Another image in that sutta is the image of someone being dragged towards a, a, a burning pile of coals. And this image uh, has to be understood in conjunction with another sutta where there's a leper who has such pain from their wounds that shoving their limbs into fire actually feels good because the pain stops. This is how we are sometimes with our with our suffering, we're experiencing pain and we go towards an even greater danger thinking that, that will relieve our suffering, such as addict addictive cycles of behavior. And then the Buddha said that these sensual pleasures are like a dream. They're so illusory. You just have to look at Advertisements, right? Everyone's young and beautiful. They're enjoying their salad, you know, <laughs> laughing with excitement about their salad. That's not real. <laughs> Have you seen that on the buses? Or, you know, these, these advertisements, they, they just create this world of desire that just is a complete fiction. You know, when you see images of, of um, people living in America in these dramas, you know, that everyone's rich. They've got huge houses. But we just know that that's not real. So this is an illusion. The Buddha said that these sensual pleasures are like borrowed goods. And the image he uses in this sutta, the Vitalia Sutta, is someone who's borrowed like all this jewelry and fine clothes and is strutting around the village. Look at me. Uh, but they don't belong to them. <laughs> People will come and ask for them back, right? 
you know, we, we, we have a lot of borrowed goods. Perhaps the bank owns most of our house or our car, yeah, or we're in debt. Or you might even think that a lot of the stuff that you have, you just can't take it with you. You call yourself the owner. This stuff can be taken away at any moment, like I said, by floods, by fire, by thieves, the government. And certainly when you die, you can't take them with you. You are not the owner. These are borrowed. These things do not belong to you. And the last image in this sutta is the image of uh, fruits in the tree. And this person comes along and he thinks, oh, look, this, free, this tree's got lots of fruits in it. Uh, I don't have a, an axe. Why don't I just climb up and grab some fruits? But as he's climbing the tree, someone else comes along with an axe and starts cutting the tree down. You know, so, of course, they're just going to... And this other person's not only going to cause them harm, but they're going to take all the fruit. And so this is maybe, again, like this idea of competition, while we're busy enjoying our sensual pleasures, someone else is coming along to take them away from us, to compete with us for them. And so in this sutta, the Buddha is trying to get us to think about the drawbacks of sensual pleasures. And we know that there's other drawbacks, like they, they're just impermanent, right? Our tastes change. Things that used to make us happy no longer make us happy. People who used to make us happy no longer make us happy. Things, food, objects, clothes. It's so impermanent and changeable. And that's why it's suffering. So what do you do for fun? What do you do for fun? Huh? Holiday. Holiday full of drawbacks. Right? First of all, you have to experience some culture shock. Maybe someone's going to try to scam you. You get to the hotel. They haven't made your booking properly. So many drawbacks. Let's think. Huh? Family gathering. So many drawbacks. We don't even... <laughs> sure, there's positives, right? So, actually, that's what we're going to do now. So... So you can see over here, I've got this whiteboard and I've got, thanks Bobby, sorry, I've been in real, real trouble for the camera persons. So here's fun stuff. Okay, so you might just list a few things like for me, I like to drink coffee. Or I like to go and watch sunsets. Or, um, anyway, so you probably have more than me. So I was talking to Ben Rubble before, and like, what do you do for fun? And we're like, um. <laughs> so let's see. With coffee, there's a lot of there's a lot of pros, right? Coffee tastes great. Yum, great flavor. Yes. Sometimes it's a nice atmosphere in the cafe. Um, good feeling, yeah? What sense am I using when I drink coffee? Taste, yeah. Sometimes, oh, smell, yeah, good, yeah, good smell. Aroma, all right, aroma, that's how the coffee people would, they wouldn't say nice smell, nice aroma. And so this is like the things that make me think, yeah, coffee's great. But then there's some cons. The other day someone made me a coffee, and I haven't been having a lot of coffee. They made me this coffee that was so strong, I could feel my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's overstimulating. And I had to I had to give a talk, 
and I started to do the namotasa and I just felt like my whole being was completely like out of control. And I was really worried that I was going to muck up just like the, the beginning of the chanting. And then I had to talk a little bit about what we were going to do. And I, I was, it was like I wasn't even there. It's just the coffee. So it was a bit overstimulating. It was a bit intoxicating. And, you know, the other thing is sometimes people make you a really bad coffee and it tastes horrible. I can't rely upon coffee for happiness, can I? Caffeine. Oh, well, thank you. Okay. I'm an addict now. Okay, addiction. Yes, it's true. It's pretty easy to get addicted to coffee. So you can see that there's some drawbacks, right? And for me as a monk, like, I don't have any money. I can't go and get one when I want one. I can't just go to a nice cafe like you can and just hang out. So for me, it's like wanting coffee. There's some drawbacks involved, right? Okay, so you understand what I'm asking you to do. Let's take sunsets. So sunsets are beautiful and they're free, right? So what sense am I using for sunsets? Sight, yeah. So they look beautiful. So they're free. Serene, you feel serene watching a sunset. Blah, 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 blah. More and more positives. And then there's the cons. Sometimes, yeah, I can't see the sky. Clouds. A lot of the time you go to watch the sunset and it's disappointing. You have to walk home in the dark. Huh? You can't consume it. Time consuming. Yeah, you have to kind of, yeah, okay, time. And then actually it, it doesn't last long at all. Short time. So you see what I'm trying to get you to do? I'm trying to get you to look at these things in a more balanced way. Usually when we talk about sunsets, we're like, oh my gosh, the sunsets are so beautiful. But actually there are some drawbacks. Like, I'm not trying to ruin your life. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm asking you to do is to, to look in a balanced way so that we can understand the enjoyment and the drawbacks. So we're just going to spend 10 minutes doing this to divide your page kind of like what I have with pros and cons and then a few fun stuff at the top, maybe just one or two, and then just choose one to focus on pros and cons. And this is private. We're not going to um, we're not going to put this up on the wall. What's your fun stuff? No, you just do one or two. I just wanted to give you options because sometimes you start thinking about one and then you're like, oh, actually, I, I can't work with this. I need something else. So does anyone want to share with the group their fun stuff and good times and the bad? Yep. What were the good stuff first? And they are, right? Yeah. And then the drawbacks.
That's true. That's the worst part about travel, isn't it? You can't always be traveling. And then you miss that excitement of travel, right? And then the worst thing is you've got something to compare your life to. <laughs> and you're like, if only I was back in Bangkok. Okay, very good. So there's like there's just to just to make sure we're all clear, there's nothing wrong with having enjoyment in your life or doing some travel or having some fun. But we're looking at how we can see beyond the way that we've been having fun to a different kind of enjoyment, a spiritual enjoyment. So it's not like I want to take away everything that you love and enjoy and stop you from having any fun. No, we want to increase the enjoyment in your life, increase the happiness, but it's a different kind of happiness, a different kind of joy. So anyone else want to share? Go on, Lily. Uh huh. You have to be a maid. Ah. Oh. Very good. Okay, good. So Lily is starting to, to teach us about the third thing. So I said, remember, there's three things. Do you remember what they are? There's the enjoyment. There's the drawback. And then there's the escape. Yeah. So understanding with wisdom, this is impermanent. And seeing through these things helps us to become less attached to them. And the Buddha said that the way we escape from sensual pleasures is to give up the desire and greed for sensual pleasures. So we give up that desire, that need for them. So, for example, take something like my coffee. Like, coffee's great. But if I don't have coffee, I suffer. I suffer because I have the attachment and the greed and the craving for it. And so if I can give up that, then when someone comes and brings me a coffee, I'm like, oh, okay, I can enjoy it. If someone doesn't come and doesn't bring me a coffee, I'm okay, right? So you see the way our suffering is actually about the desire and craving and attachment that we have to these things. You wanted to share? Oh. Uh, watching TV drama. Oh. <laughs> Do you have a favorite? What's your favorite TV drama? Uh, at the moment, it's uh, afternoon, 3.30 to 5.30. Uh -huh. Hokkien drama from Taiwan. Taiwan drama. Is it like a historical drama? Uh, it's a family drama. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, I, I watch it because uh, I, I've been a Hokkien. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I don't know much Hokkien. Okay. I'm learning the language. Ah, good. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh huh. Mm. Because uh, you always come along with uh, very good looking actors and actresses. 
<laughs> All the beautiful people, right? Oh, yes. Oh, I, I understand. Yeah. And it is a romantic drama. Yeah. Oh. So it doesn't sound like there could be possibly many drawbacks. What's, what's the one, some of the drawbacks then? Oh, the drawbacks. Maybe it takes a lot of time. Yeah, an hour and a half, right? Yeah. Two hours. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Oh, you suffer. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> No judgment. We don't judge here. No judgment. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sadhus, yeah. This is a good example. I mean, yeah. drama is, to me, it's like that. Yeah. Drama is your drug. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. I really appreciate that. And you really gave me a good insight into uh, how you understand what we've been talking about. And I enjoyed that actually. So thank you for sharing. It's very, you're very, it's very brave to share this part of ourselves with the group. So it's so important that we don't make any judgments, and we understand, um, you know, both these pros and cons. Do you have one more before we before we finish up? Anyone else? Good food. Okay. Good food. <laughs> I, butter, right? Yeah, everything cooked in butter. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Ah, very true, yeah. Last one. Crochet. That's right. Oh, you lose sleep over it. Yeah. And then what do you do with all your crochet? Yeah. Uh -huh. Nice. Yeah. Oh, great. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, yeah, these things like, so firstly, thank you again to both of you for sharing. And it's interesting how sometimes we can actually approach these things with a very Dharma, you know, lens. So we, we, a lot of the things that we, we do in the world are part of our spiritual experience also, right? So a lot of our pleasures we can, we can understand through Dharma lens. You know, we, we bring our understanding of Dharma into our daily life and it helps us to understand what's going on in our daily life. The things we do, our behaviours, um, we understand the truths of the Dharma. We see them all the time, like this is suffering and you're just stuck in it. You just keep on doing it anyway. Right? You know, oh, this is impermanent. This is not satisfying and yet you find yourself doing it. And it helps us understand. 
And so that's why we, we bring this Dharma awareness into our daily life. Like that's where it has to show up. We need to actually apply the Dharma in our life, not just keep it theoretical. And so, yeah, we understand, like when we're doing stuff like you, it's like just one more row, just one more row. It's like that's craving, you know, and it's so strong. And it's so, um, you see the power of that craving, just one more row, and you can't get any satisfaction, you can't get any peace, you can't get to sleep. And it's crazy, right? And so for all of us, it's going to be different things. And I think that's really good for people to know. For some people, it's this thing. For some people, it's that thing. You're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just subject to craving and desire. And that's why the Buddha said that the escape from these things is to become free from greed, free from desire. And so that's a little bit about the enjoyment of sensual pleasures, the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, the escape from the craving and greed for those sensual pleasures that brings us freedom. And so when we practice renunciation, when we're like that little turtle, tucking our arms away, we're giving ourselves the opportunity to experience our life without that greed and desire for stuff, for fun stuff happening to us that relies upon those sensual pleasures. We're experiencing our mind without needing that sensory input and overload, without wanting more and more stuff. We're practicing letting go of stuff, not needing stuff. We're coming out of that cycle of craving, greed, attachment. And in this way, we get a taste of freedom. So when we experience that small taste of freedom, we're actually experiencing the freedom of Nibbana. We're getting a small taste of that experience the Buddha had of complete freedom. And that's why that happiness that comes with Nibbana is the highest happiness, the highest bliss, because it's so free from attachment free from desire, free from craving. And so now it's time for us to test our power of renunciation. On this retreat, you get to be a little bit like the monks. We don't get to go to the fancy restaurants and choose our food. We don't sit there thinking, oh, I'm going to make this beautiful stir fry it's going to have this and that, and then I'm going to have ice cream for dessert. We don't, we don't think about food. We just accept what people give us, and we're happy to eat whatever's there. We don't store it up and try to save it for later so that we can have that little taste again. We consume it. Of course, we, do we enjoy our food? We do. I mean, it's pretty hard to not enjoy food, right? Like, but we're not attached to it. It comes and it goes. And so that we can appreciate the flavors, we can appreciate especially the kindness that has gone into the flavors, and afterwards it's done. Yeah? So let's pay respects to the Triple Gem, and we'll go and we'll have the opportunity to eat. Araham Samha Sambhuto Bhagava 
โอทางภาคาวันทางอาปิวาเตมิสวะคาโตภาคาวาตาดัมโฮดัมหังนามาสหามิสุภาติพันโอปะกะวะโตสาวะคะสังโฆสังขังนามามิบริกุจ so So can we, is the photo at two o'clock? Is that right? Five minutes before two, we're going to do a group photo. Okay. So come just before two, we'll do a quick photo because Venerable u p e k is actually leaving today to go to Sri Lanka. So that's a bit sad. So we wanted to make sure we had a photo with Venerable, and. Yeah, so come back at five to two. But you don't forget about your own practice in between after lunch and two o'clock. <laughs>